what's good to be in the Lord's house. I'm used to obviously teaching the team, so I thought about getting some candy bars and doing like sword drills and give you all a chance. I should have done it. I was so close to doing it, but I didn't know if that was okay in big church, as my son calls it. So, um, but uh, I'm excited to be here and excited for the opportunity to uh, preach. And um, so looking forward to it. If you would go ahead and stand and turn your Bibles to Mark, Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11. And we'll begin our reading in verse number 12. I'm kind of ringing up here just a little bit. I don't know. I don't, I'm not technical, so I don't know exactly. But uh, just to kind of let you know that. But Mark chapter 11, and we'll begin reading in verse number 12. So if you, we got a little bit of a passage to read, about 14 verses. So if you haven't read this week, this will count towards your Bible reading, all right? No, I'm just kidding. But uh, verse 12, we'll start there in Mark chapter 11. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem, into the temple, and when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. I know what it's like to get that way. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out, cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and that overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves. I found it interesting while I was doing the study that doves were what the, if you were poor and didn't have money, you could go and purchase, uh, get a dove because even that, because God wanted the sacrifice no matter what. So these people were obviously taking advantage of even the poor people in the temple by making them pay for a dove that, that God, they, God did not want that happening in the first place. It would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught saying to them, is it not written, don't you know, don't you understand, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter, calling to remember it, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. I'm sure Peter might have been a little surprised by the response. And Jesus answering saith unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he, has, he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye, shall re, that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And we'll get into this, but that's not a name it, or claim, name it and claim it that he's teaching there, and hopefully we'll understand that by the end. And when you stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. I've titled tonight's message from, if you look at verse 22, which is, I think, key to the both, uh, everything that we'll be dealing with, but verse 22, and just simply this title, have faith in God. Have faith in God. With this in parentheses at the beginning, because this is an imperative, that means you put you at the beginning. So you have faith in God. I'm going to be honest with you tonight as we get going into this. This is an outpouring, I'm just going to be honest, with something the Lord's been working in my heart. And I hope that I can convey what he's been teaching and showing me to hopefully be a help to you as well. So have faith in God. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. And Lord, I don't take it lightly, and I, I'm so thankful. And I pray that you'd help me to convey 
what you've placed on my heart. And may it help those that are here tonight that we might have faith in God and why that's so important in our lives. And we'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. expectations. Those are wonderful things, aren't they? You get expectations. Some say, you know, if you don't have too high expectations, then at least you won't be disappointed, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But expectations, you know, and sometimes we have expectations and we think this is supposed to happen or that's supposed to take place and this doesn't happen and that doesn't take place in our lives. And so we wonder and we question and we, 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 we began to ask God maybe what, what is taking place or what's going on in my life. I think of the, I don't know if, if some of you might remember, but who remembers the Twinkie commercial with the bear? And he, there's this, there's, this family's camping out in the woods and they notice and so then they've got this, this the, you know, those campers that are called like the silver bullet. I don't know if you've heard of those, but they're like silver, they're just shiny silver. And this bear comes running out of the woods and like rips into the top of this camper, and then he looks inside and he goes, hey, where's the cream filling? I don't know if y'all remember that or not. Those are expectations that are let down. You know, you, he thought, man, this, this, is, this Twinkie's gonna be full, and it's gonna be wonderful, and it's gonna be great, and he tears into it, he's like, hey, where is the cream filling? One of my big, the biggest expectations, probably not really, but that, that my brother, Matthew, y'all have met him, that probably was a little bit of an expectation let down. I remember... Um, Telling him, hey, there's these tickets, they're not, they're not super expensive, but we'll get to go and we'll get to go see the Mavericks play and it's going to be awesome and, and you're going to enjoy, we'll have a good time. They had some things going on before and after, it's just, it's just we're, I was like, man, you're going to have a great time, you're going to enjoy, it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> My wife knows where I'm going. We get to there and we're, we're go up one flight of stairs and we go up another flight of stairs and pretty soon my, my father-in-law made the joke. He's like, we could have just like done the dusting for them because we were, they were so close to the roof and it, it was, the seats were really cramped. If you met my brother, he's, he's really skinny and, and really tiny. No, but, but no, he's, but he's, he's a six, five big dude. And he, he was very uncomfortable and it just wasn't as fun because I, he was like, and these definitely were, I can't remember what the price was, like 40 or something bucks for these tickets. And I, I was like, I know, I, I thought it was going to be better than that. So sometimes we have expectations and we've, we have this idea, but maybe it doesn't happen exactly the way we thought. And as we enter this passage, we understand Jesus is nearing Jerusalem with his disciples, just because I like to make sure that I, I'm not able to preach in a series, so just so we understand what's all taking place in chapter 11 to you tonight, just to give you a little uh, quick overview, but he's nearing Jerusalem with his disciples. It's, it's uh, important to understand that at this time, Jesus is entering his last week of life on this earth. It's not going to be long before Jesus will die on a cross and pay for the sins, be crucified, be spit upon, be mocked and beaten by, uh, for things that he had not done. It's entering a very serious time, obviously, in the life of Jesus. He's at the Mount of Olives and he sends two of his disciples into a village and he tells them when they arrive there, they'll find a colt that's tied that never a man has ever sat upon and that they're to loose him and bring him to where he is. The disciples go their way. They find the colt just like Jesus has said. As they're taking the colt, people begin to question and say, hey, why are you taking this? And they say, well, the master has use of him. And so they let him go. So they take it to Jesus and he begins to ride on this colt. As Jesus begins to ride on this colt, people all around him, you may know the story, they begin to spread their garments on the ground. They begin to break off limbs and they put them down as if a royal king was coming through. And as he began to do that, he begins to make his way all around those are, that are with him, they went in front of Jesus and those that followed behind him, they're just crying Hosanna to the Lord. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're just so excited. And I was wondering, what does the word Hosanna mean? But it has to do with the idea of the one who will free or the one who can succor. That means to run to or to run to for support. So as they're yelling Hosanna, what they're saying is this is the person that is going to aid us. This is the one that's gonna free us. They're 
thinking in their mind, if he is the Messiah, if he is the deliverer, that he is the one that's going to come and he's going to set down the law and he's going to free us from all this bondage, relieve us from all this difficulty. And Hosanna is like an entreaty, please come and help us do what we know the Messiah is supposed to do. We know when you come that that's what's supposed to take place. We know when you come that that is what's supposed to happen when the king comes, when the Messiah comes. Interestingly enough, it just kind of happens. He goes into the temple and nothing else really happens from it like they were expecting. The next day, as we get to our passage, Jesus and his disciples, they're headed back from Bethany. And as Jesus understood all the pains that we do, hunger and, and maybe the pain of being tired or whatever it might be, he was able to experience those exact same things as we do. And so in our passage, we find, that we find the humanity that he was 100% man in the fact that he is hungry. He's been going about, he's been doing many different things, and he is hungry. And Jesus, looking afar off, he sees over in the distance, he sees this fig tree. And obviously at this time, they, there, it, was, it says it's not the time of the figs, but they had what's called the first ripe fruits. And the, as the, the fruits would begin to be there, that there should be at least something at this time, based on the text, that there would be something on this tree. So as Jesus is walking, he looks over, he sees this fig tree, and he sees, as it says, there's a bunch of leaves there, and there's plenty of leaves. It looks like it should have some fruit on it. So he says, well, if there's, there's leaves on that tree, then there's got to be some figs on it. So he goes and he looks, if happily, you know, like when you're super hungry and you haven't eaten for a while, and you're just like, man, I'm going to bite into this juicy hamburger or whatever it is, this steak, whatever you enjoy, and you think, man, I just can't wait to get home. My wife's got this uh, food going and I just can't wait to go home and eat or whatever it might be and you're just happy and you're excited and you can't wait. That was a chance for the men to say amen but that's okay. I'm sure you wives are great cooks, okay? But anyways, so he goes over there and happily, he's like, I'm gonna find me some food here but all he found was leaves. All he saw were leaves. He didn't see anything else and to their amazement, if you look at verse 13, because he thought that there would be some. So then in verse 14, Jesus answered and said to them, no man eat fruit of, he, the, of thee hereafter forever. And the Bible says his disciples heard it. So Jesus is here. He hap says, I am hungry. I'm sure the disciples were hungry. He sees a fig tree. He says, oh, maybe there's so." He comes over here and he looks and there's just leaves. There's nothing on it. So he, he pronounces a judgment and a curse upon that, that no one else from henceforth would be able to eat from this tree. And Jesus takes the time to make sure he pronounces in the word of God that the disciples heard it. I'm sure they were like, whoa, what does that mean? Uh, no one's going to eat any more off this. What, like, I couldn't, they couldn't probably even picture exactly what was about to take place, what was actually going to happen. And they just walk on. It's not like he stops and it's like they're all like waiting to see what happens in the street. He just goes on. And the Bible says that Jesus, then he enters into the city of Jerusalem and he goes into the temple. If you look in verse 15, and they come to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. Those that would be the bankers of that time that were trying to just make money off people that were coming into town and those that maybe sold doves like we talked about that were supposed to be taking care of the fact that God said, I want a sacrifice from your heart. Even if it's two little doves, I want you to give to me a sacrifice. And yet there was people sitting there as people were coming in the temple and saying, look, I'll sell you these two doves. I'll sell this to you if you need, oh, maybe your lamb or maybe it had, we found a blemish on it. Or maybe you just didn't take the time you were in a hurry to get here. Here, we'll sell this to you. When God is very clear, it's not about just the sacrifice. It's about the attitude of the heart. And so Jesus is going through, and as you might say, he's cleaning house. He is throwing the money changers over, and he's he, those that are selling things and those that are doing that which is not supposed to be taking place, and he is taking care of it. And Jesus rebukes them openly for their misuse of God's house as well as how they sh the house should have been operated. 
Look at what it says in verse 17. And he taught them, saying unto them, is it not written? In other words, that's one of your favorite sayings, and I feel like as a parent I say it more now, but it's, I'm sure it's, you know, it's the, something you just really want to hear. Didn't you know that? That's something that you're supposed to know. Is it not written? My house among all the houses and among all the nations is to be known as a house of prayer. My house is to be known of people that have faith and that trust in God and that believe God. And because of that belief in God, they pray to God and they ask him and petition him and they want to, to be right with him. And he said, my house is not a place of just selling and buying and a religion that is of convenience. No, he said, my, the house is supposed to be known as a house of prayer. He says, I know other nations may be known for other things, but my house among all the nations is to be known as a house of prayer. But look how um, straightforward he is with them. End of verse 17. But ye have made it a den of thieves. Instead of a house of prayer, this is a hideout for thieves and robbers and outlaws, people that are not doing what God had told them to do. G. Campbell Morgan, in regarding to the temple, said, its intentions violated and its shelter sought as a vice under the garb of religion. The precincts of the temple invaded by money changers, listen to this, who contemporary writers tell us were so nefarious in their practices that witnesses, they were refused as witnesses in the courts of law. So these people that are saying that they're religious and that they're doing what God is telling them to do, they're actually people that are just hiding out and they were so deceitful and such liars that their opinion or when they went before the court of law was not even allowed to be there because they were known for being deceitful and liars. And might I say that it should be known that, that, that amongst the community that's out there, when they think about Trinity Baptist Church, is not just someone that talks one thing on Sunday and lives another thing Monday through Saturday. That it's not hypocrites that say one thing and live one way on Sunday and then just use that as a cloak to maybe make themselves feel better or to make sure they maintain their reputation, but seriously, that they desire to worship God. You see, he goes on to say, Jesus found the spiritual and moral rulers antagonistic to him. His ideals refused. His interference resisted. They didn't want him to have any part. That's why later on we find out they're trying to find some way to kill Jesus. And preeminently and supremely, the death of faith, which is the true principle of their national life. I think of when Jesus said this, when I come, will I find faith? And that doesn't mean that you don't have faith in something. That means that you have faith, and this is the way I always describe it, that you have faith in what God is saying and what his word says, that you're actually living it out. I think about the, the ruler that he just said, look, Jesus, just say that my servant will be healed and it'll happen because I believe in the power of your word. And Jesus says about this Gentile, I've never seen such great faith, no, not in Israel. He's talking about Israel, his own people who he came to that rejected him and wanted nothing to do with him. He said, they don't have that faith, but this Gentile, this person that Israel would look at as an outcast, he just believes what God says and believes that God's gonna do what he had promised. And he says, I've not seen faith that would just take me at my word. And if we're gonna have the faith that pleases God, we're gonna have to take God at his word. He says, and I, I think, uh, how do the people in our community view our church? Do we use church as a mask to how we really live our lives? Do we go to church to keep our reputation up with other members in the church? Or do we come each Sunday and Wednesday to glorify God? You see, if Jesus was to visit and attend our church service tonight, what changes would he make? What different, what would he do differently? I mean, he obviously came into the temple and he says, I'm not pleased with this. I'm not pleased with the way you're doing this because you're not lining up with what God has said in his word. And sometimes we think about it, but he we understand that every believer that has trusted in Jesus as their personal savior has the Holy Spirit indwelling them. 
has the Holy Spirit living. So he's here amongst us where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. And so he is here with us tonight. And I don't know exactly how Jesus, as we keep going, said this. I don't know if he just said in a way, don't you know it's written? I don't know if it was in that tone, that my house shall be a house of prayer. It's hard for me in my imagination not to imagine as he's throwing tables left and right that he's probably, I mean, don't you know? Isn't this something you should understand? My house among all the nations is to be a house of prayer. And we understand that uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, as he's saying this, I don't know, it says that he taught And I imagine as he's doing this, he's teaching his disciples who are with him. But we understand that as he's teaching, there would be others that would be around and they would hear what was taking place. And so the chief priests and the scribes, they heard it. Verse 18, and they saw it, how they might destroy him because they feared him. It's amazing when you might look up a word, how it kind of changes your idea of what the passage, because it it talks about how they feared him. Yes, they feared that this man that is turning their tables, they're turning their lifestyle upside down. They're used to living a certain way. They're used to doing certain things. And now this man, Jesus, is coming through and saying that they're pretty much sinners for what they're doing and they're wicked and they're not right with God because of what they're involved in. But then it says this, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now, I knew astonished, you know, amazed, you know, you're uh, just um, in awe of what, what is taking place and the doctrine that Jesus had, and you're listening. But it has to do with to strike out. The reason, or to expel by a blow, to drive out or away, commonly to strike one out of self possession, to strike with panic or shock. So the reason that they, the, the, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees, the reason they were astonished was because God had Jesus, God had dealt them a blow. They were used to doing the way they said and, and, and how they thought it should be done. But here Jesus, God himself is among them and he delivers a knockout punch. He delivers a blow to them and now they're impanded because now they're saying, oh, our our livelihood and what people think of us because we always have an outward show. We like to pray and make sure everyone hears our long prayers and and we like to make sure everybody cares about what our opinion is and we want to make sure it's known. And now this Jesus is coming and he's saying everything you've ever thought or that they're teaching you and these traditions that they're telling you are totally wrong and not right with God. And so now they're impanded. They're saying, what is going to happen to our livelihood? This is what we're used to. This is who we are. And and Jesus is going to take this away. If all these people start following Jesus, then no one's going to care about me. Which shows they have the wrong attitude because what did Jesus say? Jesus or John say, John said, I must decrease and he must increase. I am not the most important. I'm not even worthy, John said, to unlatch his shoelace. I'm not even worthy of that. But yet these scribes and these Pharisees, they were astonished because their possessions might be gone there. And they were in panic because God was taking what they thought was theirs. And so the scribes and the chief priests, they they could not figure out a way to destroy him. And when even was come, Jesus went out in the city and in the morning they passed by this same fig tree that they had, Jesus had cursed. And he noticed, and he said, look in verse uh, 20, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance with him, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. I don't know if you hear it in his voice, uh, from what I read from it, he's just amazed. He's like, that tree that you cursed just yesterday, it's withered away from its roots. It's, it's like dried up, it's gone. And he's like, master, look, look at this. Behold, take a look at what's taking place here. It's, it's dried up, it's just. And I, want, I thought of this, what they heard Jesus say, they saw come to pass. 
And might I say, anything written in the word of God, you can trust. And I know it's easy to, to think that way and what we say and to people, but I'm telling you, it's different to live it, isn't it? It's one thing for me to say that whatever God says in the word of God, I can trust, but it's another thing to live it when things aren't going exactly the way we thought. Or something happens that wasn't planned the way we thought it was supposed to be planned. And we wonder what's happening. I mean, God, I, I, I do want to serve you. I don't believe there's anybody here tonight that says, I, I, I'm just here on a Wednesday night. But I believe you do want to serve God. I do, you do want to live for God. You do want to be what God would have you uh, to do. But we need to understand when things don't look the way they're supposed to, trust the hand that you cannot see. Trust the hand that you cannot see, but you know is there by faith. I can't help but think of different prayer requests that were given tonight, or maybe someone that's still on the list, or someone that maybe you haven't unspoken, and maybe you didn't mention it, and you're asking God, and you're wondering, how is this going to work out? What is going to take place? How is this situation going to be resolved? I have this family situation, or this person that's not saved, or I have this family member that's not in church, and God, how is it all going to work out? Have faith in God. You have faith in God, and trust him. Trust the hand that you can't see. I, I love the song, I'm holding to the unseen hand that guides me through this weary land. Because God didn't promise you wealth and health and prosperity in this life. You see, I, I don't know as Peter said, behold, master, look at that. I don't know he, what he thought Jesus' reaction was going to be. Was he going to be like, huh. <laughs> the tree did wither. I just said that, and it happened. I don't think that's what happened, okay? It's not like, oh, well, I guess it did take place. I, I, I have some pretty powerful words. No. No, he knew exactly what was going to happen, and Jesus, as we get into the meat of this text, I'm sure Peter could not have imagined the response that Jesus was going to give. It seems when you, if you, if you don't study it out, it can seem like it's totally out of con or totally not associated with this whole situation. You see, Peter was so amazed at how powerful Jesus' words were. You would think he would have been uh, he's amazed at how what, the power of God's word you'd have thought that he'd have been more aware of that. Okay, let's see what we do this in youth class, but let's see if we know where we're at. What time in Jesus' life is this? This is the last week he's on earth. This isn't when Jesus started his ministry. This isn't when he first began to do his miracles. No, Jesus is about to go to the cross. In my Bible reading a few days later after I was reading this, he's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating great sweat drops as of blood, asking God um, to remove this from him. But nevertheless, God's will and not his. Because he understood that. So this is not the beginning. I mean, Jesus, I mean, Peter has seen the feeding of what? The 5,000, right? Jesus, uh, Peter has seen the feeding of the 4,000. Peter has seen Jesus walking on the water. Jesus has seen him calm a storm. Peter has, I keep saying the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying. Peter has seen him heal a leper and raise someone from the dead and, and, and cause the blind to see and cause those that were crippled to walk again. He has seen this and now this happens. He's like, look at this. But we're pretty forgetful ourselves, aren't we? We're pretty forgetful ourselves at things, and that's why Peter would write later on, you know what his phrase would be? He said, I write to you to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Because as human beings, we are forgetful. And we can forget about how God has answered prayer in the past. We can forget about how God has, has been faithful to us in the past, and we can forget about all his blessings and all he has done for us. And I didn't even have this in my notes, but I thought it was pretty awesome. And at college days that we went to, Brother Gaddis preached on a Wednesday night, and he said this, if God removed all of his blessings, would you still serve him? 
If God removed all of his blessings, yes, God promises to bless, but he talked about Job and does he serve you for not? Does he serve you just because of the blessings he can get? And if God was to do that, would you still serve him? Would you still live for him? Would you still have faith in his power? Would you still trust that his ways are perfect? Would you still truly believe that every morning his blessings are new and great is thy faithfulness? Would you truly still believe that? And I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm standing here asking myself the same thing. But we are prone to forget. And we see Jesus' answer to Peter. When he's amazed at the power of Jesus and the fact that he was able to say, no one's going to eat any more fruit off you if see, now you're not producing fruit. And the next day it was withered away. Jesus responds to that. Look at verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. In other words, have faith that what I would say is true and what I would say would come to pass. Uh, uh, Jesus, what do you, what do you mean? Uh, compared to this, what do you mean have faith in God? What, what are you talking about? What does a dried up and withered fig tree have to do with faith in God? Well, we need to understand that in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, God's chosen people were referred to as a fig tree. You can look at Jeremiah, Hosea, Nahum. You can look that he can talk to them in terms of that they were a fig tree. And God had given the, his law to Moses. He had told them in the Old Testament, as you read through the book of a number Leviticus, and you'll see he said, look, if you obey what I've told you to do, then there is going to be blessing. If you disobey what I do, there is going to be cursing. It's your choice. God's desire is always to bless. God's desire is always to give us the things that we need to, um, the needs that we do have in this life. But throughout their history, Israel would not obey God, but would go their own way. And before we're hard on them, we need to understand that many times we go our own way. God says, look, if you do this, there is blessing. And if you do this, there is my help in your life. And we say, no, I can handle it. Look, I know you think that this boss is not treating you the way you should. Well, I can handle it, God. I'll take care of it in my own way. I mean, we want to take care of ourselves. And throughout their history, Israel will not obey God. And because of that, they would not do what he said. Therefore, they would not obey what God told them to do. And because of their unbelief uh, to God, to obey his commands, God would place them in captivity. You can look in the book of Judges and the Kings. You can look throughout the minor prophets and the major prophets. And you'll see how God over and over had to put them in captivity because they would not believe God. They would not trust God. They would not do what God had told them to do. And even now, well, that's old, well, even now, at this very moment, we just read how the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're desiring to kill Jesus. They don't like what he's doing. They don't care who he, for who he is, even though he is God that is right there with them. They still do not have faith in him. They still do not want him around. They still want him done away with John 1, 12 says he came unto his own and his own received him not. They would make statements like this. We will not have this man rule over us. Therefore, because they did not have faith in God, they were, they were not producing any fruit. They were not producing any fruit because they were like this fig tree and God was, came to them. I'm, I'm reminded, I didn't put it in my notes, but I'm reminded of the story of the, of the, the vine dresser and he goes away and, and he sends other people to check on his, his vineyard and they kill him, which would represent the prophets and would kill prophet after prophet that were sent. And the, 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 the vineyard, uh, the person over the vineyard said, I'll send my own son to them. And they killed him. 
and they took his life. And it's like Jesus is saying over and over, now I have looked on you and I've tried getting you to be what you're supposed to be. And now Jesus, the very son of God, is right here among you. Jesus, the very one that loves you and cares for you and wants to see you produce fruit. And now I come to you and it's just like you look good from a distance, but on close examination, there's no fruit in your life. And so God, as he began to look, he saw that there was plenty of leaves, but absolutely no fruit. You see, there were, their only concern was, with, was looking good on the outside. But on close examination, listen, by Jesus, they were not fulfilling their purpose of producing fruit. You can see why this might frighten the disciples to hear those are uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious elite. These are the people that are supposed to know what God says. These, if there was anybody that was spirit, supposed to be spiritual, it was supposed to be the scribes and the Pharisees. They were to know the law. They were supposed to be living the law. They were supposed to be right with God. And yet they were not producing fruit. So you can imagine as disciples are putting this all together, they're wondering, am I producing fruit? Am I producing what God has put me here to do? And they might be wondering, am I producing the fruit that God would have me to do? And so that's why the statement in verse 22 is so important that Jesus would answer and say unto them, have faith in God. You see, the disciples would produce fruit for God by having faith in God. If they, if they were concerned because the, if the Pharisees and the scribes, they weren't living for God, they weren't doing what God was telling them to do, and they weren't being what God wanted them to be, then of course you would have to take an inward um, look at yourself and say, am I producing fruit? Because when Jesus comes and looks at my life, sure, I've been following Jesus around for the last three and a half years, but am, as a disciple of Jesus, am I producing fruit in my life? And the question has to rise, and I hope you're asking yourself, even tonight on a Wednesday night, in the middle of the week, are you producing fruit for Jesus Christ? Are you being what God would have you to be? And if you're wondering, how do I make sure that I produce fruit for God? Well, the way you produce fruit for God is by having faith in God. Faith in God, well, for what? For anything, for whatever it is that's in your life, do you have faith in God that you believe his word? Do you believe, if you believe he's powerful enough to say that to a fig tree and it happened, do you believe that whatever God said in his word, you can trust it and believe it? You see, a fruit that is not producing fruit is no real, has no real value. It's like salt that has lost its savor. You see, he was not giving them the secret to destroying fig trees, but the secret for living the way that they should not be destroyed as the fig tree had been destroyed. You see, Christ today is still seeking fruit. Christ is still desiring fruit from our lives you see, John 15, 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Christian, tonight, are you producing fruit in your life? You see, don't settle for just leaves. Don't settle for the fact that us, that we see you at church, we say, that's a Christian. They're living for the Lord. They're doing what God told them to do. They're living a life of faith. They have faith in God that they don't just talk the Bible, but they live the Bible. They don't just say they believe the Bible, but they actually live out the Bible in their life. And it's one thing for us to understand that and know that here because we know how to dress the part. My sons, as an example tonight, they wanted to, because daddy was preaching, they wanted to wear a suit. And it made it more tough on my wife, but I appreciate her for doing that. But we know how to look the part. I know I'm not, I wasn't going to come up here in a t-shirt and shorts. I, I don't, that probably wouldn't go too well, I don't think. But anyway, I hope not. Anyway, all right. I'll try. No, I'm joking. But the question is, when you go out there, do the people that you work with do you show fruit? Or is it just a bunch of leaves and we know how to make it look good and to make it look right? Don't settle for just leaves. Cultivate a close relationship with the Lord. 
And you may be wondering, how can I be sure that I produce fruit? How can I be sure that I am having fruit in my life that is pleasing to God so that when God comes and examines and ha- comes happily that he might receive fruit, that he actually finds fruit? Well, the same way, is for, the same way as it was for the disciples, is, is if it was good for back then, it's good for us today. And the way that you can make sure that you produce fruit for God is by having faith in God. That whatever God's word says, even if I don't feel like it, or even if it doesn't seem like it's true in my situation, or even if it doesn't seem like it's going to take place, that whatever God has promised, that is what he is going to do. Have faith in God. You see, have faith that what God says will always be true. What God says will always come to pass. God is not looking at your life or whatever is taking place and going, huh, I'm surprised that that took place. I'm surprised that that's happening. I didn't know that that was going to take place. No, God knows everything. And we need to trust that what he is working in our life, he will work it to our good in the end. You see, I love the song and you finish it for me. Jesus loves me, this I know. No one's saying this growing up? Come on, wake up a little bit. Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, we, we sing that as kids, but that's such a profound truth. The fact that I know God loves me simply because the Bible says it. And God, if I'm having struggle with anger or bitterness or I'm struggle with anxiety or our fears or whatever it might be in my life, that I can trust that God is going to be there and do what I need in my life as long as I'm surrendering to him. You see, you need to have faith in God's way, his perfect purpose and his plan for your life. Constantly be trusting God. Live in an attitude of dependence on him. You see, in the Jewish imagery, and even today, we look at a mountain as something that is impossible to move. But the, and the only way that we're going to move mountains that are in our life is that we would trust God. You see, in verse, verse 23, Have faith that God hears your prayers, not doubting in your heart, but believing they will come to pass, believing you will receive what you ask. Listen to this, to have a fruit, a fruitful life, is to have a prayer-filled life. To have a fruitful life is to have a prayer-filled life. You see, prayer is an expression of faith. You pray to someone you've never met, You pray to someone you've never seen because prayer is an expression of faith as I have a difficulty or I have a problem and I go to God and I say, God, I have this problem or I have this and I'm I'm bringing it to you. That's faith that God is going to be there for you and that he is real. It's the truth that we show that expression of faith in our life. You see, however, we must not isolate this passage from other passages and think, um, well, if I just pray it, God's going to give it to me. We understand that this is from a spiritual paradigm. This is from a spiritual perspective. You see, prayer must be done in the will of God. 1 John 5, which I'm sure Pastor will get to, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. In fact, James would say, look, there's sometimes that you don't get what you want because you ask amiss. You're not asking according to God's will. So if you're like, God, I'd like to win a million dollars when I play the lottery next week. Okay, I don't play the lottery. Just thought I'd make sure that's clear. Well, God probably is not going to answer that. Well, God, I, I, you know, I'll serve you if you give me a million dollars. Lord, I'll serve you if you give me a bigger house. Lord, I'll serve you if you just make my kids. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I will serve you if you help me in this situation. That's not the prayer that is just that God is concerned about. Because God is concerned about spiritual things. God is concerned about are you spending time with him? Are you witnessing to others? Are you dying daily to yourself? You pray those things, God, help me be conformed to your image. That's what he's talking about. But we don't pray that very often. You see, Psalm 37, verse four and five says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You see, the one praying must be abiding in God's love. You see, we need to understand prayer is not an emergency measure that we turn to when we have a problem. Real prayer is a part of our constant communion with God and worship of God. 
So the other part we need to understand about that part is that this is not a pastor saying, if I just believe really hard and I pray really hard, then God's going to give it. That's not what that's talking about. You see, faith in God must be based on his word. And I love this. And I've actually heard this quote before. And it has been said, the purpose of prayer is not getting man's will done on, in heaven, but getting God's will done on earth. It's not about me, God, you do this for me. We deserve hell. We deserve eternity separated from God. We deserve nothing but destruction and being condemned. But God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners. So if you're gonna produce fruit for God, you have to have faith in his word, which means you're gonna have a close relationship with him. But the second part that goes along with that, if you're going to have and bear fruit, you're going to have to have faith in God and the fact that you're willing to forgive others. And that's just, I mean, because I, only God could put this together. I mean, that's not, I mean, I would just say, read God, know God, spend time with him. But he says, look at verse 25. And when ye stand, when you're firm in what you're praying, if ye have ought against any, that your father also, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. See, our forgiving spirit is one evidence that our hearts are right with God and that we want to obey him. That we want to do what he wants us to do. And this makes it possible for God to hear and to answer our prayers. And I think pastor said not too long ago, but if you're not, if you have something against someone else, God's not going to hear your prayer. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You see, if I have faith in God, I will also love my brother. So God says, look, you want to produce fruit, then you got to have faith in me. You gotta believe that what I say is true, what the word of God says is real and that it's trustworthy and you can depend on it. And that's why he says, therefore in verse 24, I say, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them and ye shall have them. And then you have to be willing to forgive other people. You have to be willing to ask for forgiveness And to give forgiveness. You see, if God expects a fig tree to produce fruit, what do you think that he expects of those that he's bought with his blood? You see, the only way you will produce fruit for God is by having faith in God's word. Faith in God is the key to a life of fruitfulness for God. So the question is, does Jesus... When he examines your life, find fruit. Is there fruit in your life? Well, the way you're going to have fruit in your life is by having faith in God. That he can accomplish what his will is for your life. 